this year. My name is Andrew Chen. Uh, I'll be introducing Violin Memory and then I'm going to turn it over in the back half to Vikas Ratna who's with me, our chief architect who can uh, lead you through the uh, deep details of our technology and what we have to offer. I want to tee up very briefly with talking about some of the problems that we're trying to solve and I think that we have in common as IT practitioner, right? Data growth uh, certainly needs no explanation. However, it is important to consider whether solutions are able to effectively meet data growth challenges while also delivering an acceptable performance experience. And that's something that I think has become increasingly challenged over time as folks look to consolidate workloads and capabilities into virtualized infrastructures. Pressure and cost also needs no introduction. It is important to consider, though, that even though cost capacity has come down at a rate where the capex of storage acquisition has remained relatively flat, TCO operational complexity, power and cooling uh, have continued to spiral out of control and remain difficult challenges to manage. Data is a competitive weapon. Consider the fact that IT isn't necessarily just a cost center, but also the ability of your IT to deliver differentiated and unique capabilities to your business can be something that can help you grow revenue and help you transform your ability to support your customers. Uh, and finally, regulatory, right? So we, we live in, a, in an increasingly threatened uh, environment um, where we continue to see natural disasters as well as intrusion and incursion attempts and hostile attacks on our IT infrastructure. And it's very important that any solution be able to meet these demands. And we'll certainly get into all of this. Who is Violin Memory? Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Violin Memory, we were the pioneers who invented the first NAND flash uh, storage array 10 years ago. We developed a lot of the core IP that today is utilized to manage and effectively transform NAND flash into an enterprise storage solution. But I think it's also important to understand that in that 10 year history, we have recently transformed and gone significantly behind just delivering raw performance via NAND flash into using flash as a foundation for a primary storage platform. Who counts on Violin? Over our history, we've developed very deep and significant engagements with many of the top companies. <clears throat> Certainly all of the leaders in various industries and across very significant verticals have found and used our technology to transform their capabilities and to deliver, deliver solutions that meet their customers' requirements. Some key highlights about who we are as a company. I think it's very, very much worth noting that we are the only publicly tra traded and fully transparent all flash array vendor, right? We're not one piece of a large portfolio. Uh, we're not a private company. So credibility absolutely counts. Our operations, our results, our investments, and how we're doing is fully transparent to the market. And we're absolutely happy to provide full details on our technical architecture over the course of this next hour. We have demonstrated results for our customers, saved billions, and also helped them at the same time to achieve hundreds of millions in new revenue opportunities and in business transformation. We originally started in the hyper-performance market, but we have evolved significantly beyond that through development of significant new software and firmware IP to enable us to deliver a comprehensively capable flash storage platform for primary data. From a technical perspective, significant capabilities that we've added. We pressed on our original hardware performance-based leadership, added inline data reduction, dedupe and compression, which gives us the ability now to deliver very effective dollars per gig cost for storage capacity, as well as layering all of the best in breed required data management, data protection features that the industry needs. And this goes beyond sort of the normal table stakes things that I'll talk about, like thin provisioning, snapshots, and clones, into the absolute most demanding tier zero data protection, stretch clusters, replication, application integration, continuous data protection. Fundamentally, our vision and what we hope to achieve for our customers is, is best summed up in this graphic, right? You have the legacy data center, which consists of inefficient old infrastructures, right? Mostly relying on hard disk drive or utilizing very small quantities of flash in a hybrid configuration to help remediate the challenges and the deficiencies of disk drive. Introduces a lot of cost from a floor space, power cooling, and TCO standpoint, operational complexity. And our vision is through the performance of Flash, the density, the ability to consolidate, and the ability to offer the data protection services that these legacy architectures have been relied on to consolidate that and enable our customers to transform their data center and their operations through significantly reduced cost. Just sort of a look at uh, all of the different solutions that are available today. So I think we've seen um, 
that the legacy technologies are increasingly failing to meet the challenges of today. Hard disk drive has undergone a, a, an era of performance stagnation probably for the last 10 years, where you've seen a flat number of IOPS per device. And what happens is as capacity continues to scale, uh, there's an increasing amount of white space, an increasing amount of power and cooling that's being used to drive devices that just fundamentally don't deliver enough performance headroom to meet the requirements of today, particularly application workloads and application consolidation. In the early eras of flash, we saw people use small amounts of flash when it was considered very precious and expensive to create hybrid solutions in the attempt through caching and tiering and other similar technologies to help boost the flagging performance of hard disk drive. And those solutions have definitely had some success, but they introduce a level of complexity, sizing, configuration, uh, and dependency on whether your data inherently lends itself to, uh, to cache hits. In the era of the SSD, we've seen sort of two solutions arrive. Legacy players who have basically taken the SSD, replaced their hard disk drives with SSD, and seen some significant boost from adding that capability. Um, the benefit of that type of solution is it absolutely adds data management, data protection capabilities that those solutions already delivered, but they're sub-optimized because fundamentally a file system, a storage OS, a solution that was designed around hard disk drives is not well optimized for flash and its unique attributes and does, does not deliver the level of density or performance uh, that Flash is able to drive. And then you have players who took legacy traditional storage hardware, so storage controller, a JBOT, and SSDs, and built a new Flash-based OS for it. And the biggest gift to the industry at that time was the arrival of inline data reduction, so dedupe and compression, which really helped eliminate the sticker shock or make credible the fact that Flash is not just a Ferrari. It does deliver dollars per gig cost at a, at a solution level that is equivalent or competitive with disk. But those solutions do not, have not yet matured to the state where they can provide the data management, data protection capabilities that legacy solutions have, have matured over time, right? So the problem is, up until now, we've lived in an era, era of trade-off and compromise. You can either get performance, or you can get feature set capability, or you can get cost, or you can get capacity scale. And our premise is that the right solution, what tips flash over the inflection point to the point where it can credibly become an infrastructure for all primary storage is requiring the combination of all of those capabilities. Certainly performance headroom and power, which is delivered by a differentiated and unique architecture, but also a powerful and rich software feature set. Inline deduplication and compression that should be selectable and granular. Data protection. So again, all of the usual suspects, but again, everything that you require to provide the ultimate layer of protection for your data center. And that should be including the capability to retain availability and survive a complete data center outage, right? Stretch clusters over metro distances and instantaneous failover. So Andrew, just a very quick... Uh, Absolutely. Inter inter uh, ...interject slightly. I think you're slightly underplaying the hybrid side there. Because mm -hmm. you're sort of implying that hybrid is basically things like EMC Fast, where Flash was put into a, an existing array. Mm -hmm. There's a whole um, group of vendors who are delivering hybrid using Flash in a different way to the way it was used, uh, used in those models, yeah. which obviously aren't complex or inefficient. They might not give 100% predictable I.O. They yes. have a little bit of an issue with it. Yes. But actually, they're, they're pretty, pretty robust, and a lot of them are doing things like pinning stuff into Flash that they've already got in their box to fix some of those issues. Yes. So I think the hybrid section is a bit is a little unfair because I think it's looking back at a, you know, uh, what was hybrid flash probably five or six years ago. I would definitely agree that we've continued to see significant innovation in the space of hybrid. And it's not just, again, the legacy old players, right? But there are certainly a lot of new players that have invested a lot of IP in, in hybrid. And I think those, um, those solutions do make sense. I think the paradigm that we're trying to flip around is, is still, those are born of the era where, um, where flash is a precious and sort of limited substances that can only be used in, in the most limited form. And you're really trying to have a generally hard drive centric view. We're using flashes as, as an assist, right? And again, a lot of folks have, have brought out features that have been long requested, like the ability to pin to flash or, or create those LUNs. I think we, our premise is that absolutely, it's time to turn that around and say you can use flash liberally, right? It's, it's better to have all flash and you can use data reduction um, to get you to the point where the de facto standard, particularly for your primary hot data, is flash and then use drives as something of last resort for the cold archive data. So it, it's a different paradigm and we think that the economics and again, the, the arrival of data reduction, which is absolutely very important to, to this, enables that transition or that turn. Okay. So I think one of the things with hybrid is certainly the technologies also work to varying 
uh, degrees, but it does also turn on the premise that you, you're able to coalesce a very large amount of your I.O. pattern into a small amount of the capacity footprint, right? And so for some workloads, um, that does work well, and how effective the solution delivers um, is really going to depend on the, the different caching algorithms, right? And then all the different vendors have, have done a number of different implementations that require differences in their but size. It, it also depends on, on, on the market you're going for, because yes. um, Flash is becoming a, um, a technology that can be used across all I.O. workloads. Mm -hmm. So rather than that very small amount that needed very low latency, high throughput. Yeah. So as it becomes a more generalized workload, yes. those hybrid systems could be more suitable than, than all flash systems potentially because they don't need that level of demand. So <clears throat> there's, a bit of a, there's a bit of a dichotomy in some of the, 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 the sort of messaging you're saying there. Yeah, so. no, no, that's, that's a fair point. I think our premise is that, uh, is that we're, we're aggressive about the extension of that thinking to the point where the disk drive capacity is almost, is almost vestigial or would not be frequently used. So in analyst view, um, we engaged deeply with IDC, gave them uh, a very deep dive into, architect into our architecture, our capabilities. Hopefully, we will give you the same level of visibility and understanding of what we do over the course of the next hour. Um, but they basically assessed our capabilities, and they believe um, that one flash is ready for consideration uh, as the de facto standard for primary storage, but also that after understanding the differences in our architecture, what we've done from a firmware, technology, and capability standpoint, versus the notion that all of the benefits of flash are really delivered by NAND media itself, and it does doesn't matter, do you use an SSD? Do you just retrofit an SSD into traditional storage hardware? Does a purpose-built architecture really matter? They came to the conclusion that we hope certainly will be able to lead you to over the next hour, um, that a purpose-built architecture, that architecture does matter, how you bend the flash, how you implement it, how you integrate your firmware, your storage OS, and your application integration really does matter. Um, there is a difference in that Violin has a truly unique uh, and leading technology here. So it's very important to notice, again, particularly for those who may have followed Violin but not closely over the last couple of years, that one of the biggest significant changes that we've made as a company is to deliver a significant and rich feature stack of data protection, data management capabilities. <clears throat> so certainly from a data protection standpoint, in our own native IP, we possess space-efficient snapshots, um, of course, delta changes only, uh, the ability to generate writable space-efficient clones from our snapshots, thin provisioning, uh, and then all the data protection that has to go with it. So the ability to do consistency groups, um, and also our ability to do application-integrated snapshots, right? So with an Oracle agent, you can take a a database consistent snapshot across a consistency group, combine that with replication policy, a very powerful and comprehensive state of data management, data protection capabilities. On top of that, some of the things that are not very common, continuous data protection. So we have a CDP journal capability. That journal can be asynchronously replicated to another site to give very, very granular control over the RPO uh, level and the recovery of your data. It is a true continuous uh, journal, write by write transaction granularity. So this is not a fast sample snapshot type of CDP-like offering. Uh, and then, you know, one of the most complicated and uh, but powerful and required capabilities, synchronous replication, right? And that can be done uh, within a data center, so rack to rack resiliency, uh, or across. Uh, metro distances, so you can do a stretch cluster um, with instantaneous failover for a true uh, high availability zero RPO RTO solution. We also introduced beyond our traditional single form factor array a modular scale up solution that allows the, the consolidation of capabilities from multiple arrays that enables us to achieve a scale in a single array of 700 terabytes of raw capacity and then through data reduction over two petabytes of effective logical capacity, which is really important in terms of considering large scale if you're looking to take out a traditional infrastructure. Um, you can't have a, a small array that, you know, again, in the days raw flash could really only scale to 20 or 30 terabytes, even, even as recently as a few years ago, or if you have a single array that only goes up into a couple hundred terabyte range. It's really important to be able to hit that petabyte scale uh, seamlessly, non-disruptively, uh, and scalably. In your stretch clusters, your RPO, RTO, mm -hmm. at what latency and round trip time are we looking at? Uh, it's, it's purely the speed of light. So we would typically recommend the, the usual 60 to 100 kilometer, depending on the latency that's required, right? I mean, of course, in, in theory, you could stretch that out to uh, you know, the SCSI timeout I mean, limit, but, but it's... Removing theory, yeah. 50 milliseconds, I mean, because typically everything does tie down to some solutions are we can do it 20, we can do it 50, some are like we can hack it to do 100. Do yeah. it hard and fast in order to promote zero RPO RTO, it mm. has to be at a maximum uh, latency and round trip time of X. So we typically don't recommend 
uh, if the customers have latency of over you know 20 milliseconds, for example, and they are using it for primary data storage, we typically uh, ask them to the customers ask them to reconsider if this is really a right solution because that has a, a, you know inherent latency being propagated up the application. But that's purely at the network level. From the software, you know, from, from the engineering background. Uh, from the software level, if you do measure the latency overhead that we bring in, assuming there was a light speed followed e everywhere, it's roughly 100 microsecond is what we bring in. Additional 100 microsecond is all we take, you know, uh, by adding this operation of sending it out, reconsolidating and responding it back to the application. Sure. It's, yeah. But this is never a storage problem, but in yeah. order to do cross yes. any type of distance, we do rely upon network. Mm -hmm. And thus, there's certain vendors that have a maximum recommend. It's, it's actually, it's not a recommended, it's a, this is the, this is the minimum la latency round trip time. If you can't achieve this, you cannot achieve a RPO RTO of zero. And I'm just, and if Agreed. it truly is the, it's what everyone else uses, and that, that's fine. I yeah. just wanted to kind of establish if it's one way or the other, because if you say we can do zero RPO RTO, mm -hmm. there are some hard and fast requirements because if the customer is doing at 200 milliseconds, they're like, hey, you said I could do it. Yeah. But it doesn't work, and it's like, well, it's your network team's fault. It's like, mm, but you sold me the solution, you know. And in the case of, I'll say, other vendors, they would have hard and fast. You must exactly use these specific devices, and you have to use this exact configuration. Otherwise, we're not going to support it. And I just want to, for when that type of implementation gets put in place, to ensure that you can meet and achieve that, because um, organizations that have a zero RPO RTO requirement, yeah, completely. That right. I mean, their dollars is why. I mean. I've yes. worked with a lot of companies where, hey, uh, we, we operate at $3,000 a second. Mm -hmm. if for every second we're down, we're losing $3,000 a second. Yeah. You know, and that's the nature of the business to ensure that they can meet those requirements. Absolutely, and a very valid point. So that's why we have a chart on the basis of, if you have this much of kilometer, this is the millisecond latency you are looking at for this particular you know, kind of fab uh, fabric that you have. Sure. So it's a solution development play. I think you're rightly alluding to, yeah. uh, when you do the zero RPU and zero RTU, this has to be a close collaboration between absolutely. the technical side of ours and the customer. So you're absolutely right. There's no blanket statement over here. Mm -hmm. So what I just specified was the upper end. We are extremely not comfortable if your latencies are very high. We come in and measure the latency and we tell you that. But but it's really a table based on your uh, fiber that you have and all those things. And if your SLAs don't get covered, looking at this table, mm -hmm. please go to continuous you know, data protection that we have mm -hmm. or the asynchronous application you have. So, so very valid point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. absolutely. Thank you. A um, couple of key points on this one. Data migration, right? So as, as, a, as part of any net new deployment, if you're bringing new, de new technology, it's important to also have a comprehensive set of services that can help the, uh, the customer integrate the technology into their environment. And so we offer migration capabilities. Um, and you know, from A, a migration into our array, and then also for lifecycle refresh purposes, the ability to do seamless data migration. It's also very important to note that one key premise that we have is that inline data reduction is something that should be selectable and granular because there are workloads that will get an affinity from data reduction, particularly some heavily virtualized workloads, get a really, really great dollars per gigabyte effective as well as a significantly improved experience from using a hybrid or a hard drive based solution. Um, and those absolutely should be, be on dedupe LUNs. And I think dedupe LUNs are very, very important for the flash industry as a whole because they lower the dollars per gig point where it removes the sticker shock and the Ferrari factor from in implementing a flash solution. But there are applications where latency is king, where it's not just a matter of sub millisecond as in 999 microseconds, but sub millisecond as in two to 300 microseconds, right? Because that drives up a significant increase in the number of transactions that can be processed, or again, the value of, uh, the value of money, right? And so we believe that the customers should have a choice that they should be able to use dedupe LUNs where appropriate, but also use raw thick thin LUNs where appropriate, depending on their workload needs. And they have those different tiers of solutions within Flash for performance and cost capacity as well as the fact that they should be able to transform those LUNs online and non-disruptively so that if they went for the one and they realized they need the other, and that may be something that's time-based versus you know, just a static requirement of the workload, that those can be done as well. And that's a, that's a cornerstone of our capability. So is there a huge impact if you turn on dedupe on a LUN that's previously been thick provisioned? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we offer that capability is if you have a LUN that was previously not a dedupe LUN, and you're saying, um, you know, maybe, and there's a couple reasons you could do that. Is one, you need the performance, and it could be from a seasonal or a time-bound value of that data. You're like, you know what, I don't need that anymore. I'm gonna, I'm gonna scrunch that down. 
you can transform that online and transparently. And another capability that we have is the ability to, to synchronize, to do replication across heterogeneous LUN types. So on a primary, you may say, look, this is where the database is residing. I need the maximum performance. I want to copy on a remote site that I replicate asynchronously. You can use a dedupe LUN as a replication target because you don't need as much performance on that secondary site. But then it can be promoted and hydrated online as necessary if you require performance on the secondary site later. So very powerful set of capabilities. Um, and similarly, you, if you have a dedupe LUN that you need to hydrate to get the performance, you can do that as well. So that is a, that is a capability that we offer. Most of your competitors are saying that they, are, they have all their features mm -hmm. enabled all the time. Yes. And it's, uh, from my point of view, it's, it's good because it uh, simplifies mm -hmm. a lot. Yes. And uh, even if you get only 5% advantage from the duplication, it's 5% that you mm -hmm. got. And they say, this is our architecture, and it works that way. Yes. So you, you can see a performance uh, limitation by having it on or off. Uh, yes. Uh, also. All this complexity added to the interface, to the APIs that probably you, uh, you have, and uh, does it really make sense in 2015? I think that it's a choice that we want customers to be able to have, but it's not mandatory. And I think whether whether a customer sees value in that capability depends on their perspective. So I think for an always-on implementation, um, it's easy to say that there's no performance impact because there's no basis for a comparison, right? So that product, again, always on data reduction is inherent to it, so that, that level of performance is what it is. Um, and I think a lot of the products out there, ours included, are very well optimized to deliver very good performance under deduplication. Um, but it is, uh, it, it, it is sort of fundamental to the fact that when you do deduplication, there is a lot of compute intensive, you know, tra you know stuff that's happening, right? So you have to chunk it, you have to hash it, there's index lookups, you have to land it, you have to process it, you eventually have to write to the back end. And so regardless of how well the deduplication is implemented, the, the, the fundamental fact of the matter will always be that if you are, if you are transacting to a, just a raw thick thin LUN versus a dedupe LUN, you will see a dramatic difference in performance. Now if you're coming from a hard disk drive array or even a hybrid array, particularly within a certain class of product, then a dedupe LUN will be a better experience pretty much any day. So that's fine. You could say, look, I, I don't know that I'm missing something that's up here. I'm going from here to here, and that's great, and it's a significant improvement, and that's fine. And certainly if our customers you know, want that simplicity, we also offer the same capability, right? So you can turn the dedupe on, you can just put everything into a dedupe pool, you can leave it that way, and it's entirely fine. Um, but if you have experienced you know, raw flash performance, and that's not, you know, certainly our product was, was the first in the industry, um, but there are a number of other solutions that people have touched that expose them to that level of performance, right? PCIe-based cards, um, whatnot, or again, uh, an SSD-based solution that doesn't have dedupe and compression, you see a level of performance that's up here. And so if you've experienced that product and you know what you're missing, or you have an application that can take advantage of that, then that's a capability that we think customers should be able to choose if they so wish. Yeah, and if I can quickly uh, add to Andrew's uh, comment or extend it, so you're absolutely right, that providing these knobs you know, creates some confusion. And to be honest, to putting this kind of architecture is a whole different kind of complexity as well. It would have been a lot easier for me to, you know, to drive my group to just do dedu online dedupli inline deduplication and all. But learning from, since we are you know, into the market for a longer time compared to you know, some of the new companies that came around, there is constant debate over there. Is deduplication going to help my workload? Or is it not going to help my workload? If it is not going to uh, help my workload, I'm looking at million IOPS, I can pack more and more application over there. But if it does, you know, maybe dollar per gig is important for me. So our approach is simple. Allow them to make a mistake. Let them put the workload over there. Let them make that decision later. So it's not complex in terms of setting up. You start with deduplication LUN. If you want it to be always and on, no problems. Go ahead and make all your LUNs as deduplication LUN. It's single click, right? Your LUNs by default are deduplication. You start working through your uh, load. You get the report. By the way, what I'm observing is you don't have you know, that kind of deduplication in your thing, right? And by the way, because of that, your IOPS is only, let's say, 250K. It could have been 1.5 million IOPS. Your latency could have been instead of one millisecond, 100 microsecond. What do you want to do? And the single click, you transform. So allow them to make mistake, allow them to learn their, you know, uh, their workload through us. 
because it's very difficult. What we recognized early on is if we get into a debate with the customers that, hey, your workload is not going to be benefiting from deduplication or not, it was a no-win situation because customers more often you know, are, are, not, you know, uh, are not clear about the dedupability of, of the, uh, their workload. So that's where we came up with this architecture. And in future, I think there was a good comment about talking about future. In future, we want to make it completely adaptable. You have one LAN, architecture in place, you're putting your data in. If it is not dedupable, will not do the deduplication. Of course, you'll have a choice to say, you know, uh, as a quality of service that you do that. So that's where we have put this architectural building block in place, that this is where your start point is. You don't have to worry about whether, you know, making those decisions upfront. Make mistakes, no problem. We are there, we'll cover for you. So that's the philosophy, you know, that has gone in designing this architecture. But you're absolutely right. It may seem like very complicated, but you know, how we have, you know, architected it and, and we present it to the customer, it's just a single click. And you can always say, deduplication all the way on, no problems. And then come back at, at the report and back to the question that uh, he asked, you can convert it back. Totally transparent and you know, uh, non-disruptive operation.